Hit the subscribe button or visit us at auau.auanet.org. Okay, can we can we take seats and uh, so we can start. Uh, this is um, an AUASIU symposium, uh, and uh, we are very honored as Italian Society of U of Urology to be partner in this. Uh, a uh, new adventure with the AUA. This is one of the first time that a sponsorized meeting from US uh, uh, take place uh, in, uh, in an overseas meet meeting. And so we are very uh, grateful to uh, the AUA for organizing, joining with us this, uh, this meeting. This meeting uh, on, uh, uh, focused on uh, a very exciting field in, a, in a uro oncology, which is uh, uh, immunotherapy. Uh, for kidney cancer, bladder cancer, and prostate cancer. And we have a very busy schedule. We have to leave the room at one o'clock. And so I would invite the first speaker. I would, I would invite right. Dr. Sam to present the first speaker. Right, so uh, again, thank you for this uh, wonderful opportunity. The AUA is very excited about this partnership. And we're gonna have, actually our first speaker is Dr. Bill Huang, who traveled all the way from New York to actually give this presentation and then we'll be back on a plane in a few hours. So he also wants to stay on time. So Dr. Huang, if you're gonna start uh, with immuno-oncology and this is gonna be actually a focus on kidney cancers, we go through different areas of urologic cancer. Dr. Huang. Well, thank you, Sam. Uh, I wanna thank uh, the scientific committee of the SIU and the AUA for giving me an opportunity to speak today. Uh, I'm gonna be talking about a very uh, rapidly changing field in the treatment of oncology, which is immuno-oncology, and I'm gonna focus a bit on kidney cancer and then finish the session with a talk on managing the side effects. <clears throat> so I think uh, it's really uh, no introduction to everybody here uh, to understand the fact that the immune system plays a very, very critical role in the management of not only a patient's ability to survive infection, but also to survive cancer. Now the immune system, of course, plays an integral role in the management of, of, uh, of the body's uh, response to pathogens like infection, but also in response to cancers. And so this system in which the immune system is stimulated and controlled is done through what we call immune checkpoints. Uh, and this is how the body basically maintains tolerance to itself as well as to cancers and infections. Uh, and I think we all know that in, in terms of uh, mutation load, tumor cells, particularly kidney cancer and bladder cancer cells, have a high mutation load which makes them excellent targets for immunotherapy. Uh, and tumors, however, largely gain the ability to suppress these regulatory pathways, and so in order to overcome them, uh, the, uh, uh, the field of, of medical oncology has begun using checkpoint inhibitors to treat uh, metastatic lesions and to treat cancer. Everyone knows that kidney cancer in itself is a very highly immunogenic cancer. There are multiple case reports, not only in the literature, but also in the placebo arm of multiple randomized control trials where you see spontaneous regression of metastatic lesions simply following nephrectomy. In addition, we also know that when you look at primary tumors, that there are a large number of T-cell infiltrates at the time of nephrectomy. So immunotherapy has been used in renal cell carcinoma for quite a long time. Uh, this dates back to the 90s when we were using interleukin-2 and interferon-alpha uh, with uh, nephrectomy to treat metastatic renal cell carcinoma. And this was largely abandoned, however, in the 2000s when tyrosine kinase inhibitors and other targeted therapies emerged. Nonetheless, immunotherapy has been an integral part of kidney cancer management from the very beginning. Now, what has changed the field is the development of what I called, or what, what I mentioned earlier, and what are called checkpoint inhibitors. The two main checkpoint inhibitors that we think about these days are CTA, CTLA-4, uh, which was FDA approved in 2011, and then the PDL one and PD-1 inhibitors, which were approved in 2014. Now, obviously, you're, you're gonna hear the use of these checkpoint inhibitors in a variety of different cancers, uh, particularly in the GU cancers today, and I'm gonna focus this talk on just kidney cancer. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, immunotherapy or immuno-oncology has been an integral part in the treatment of metastatic RCC from the very beginning. Uh, and really, it was uh, the development of these immune checkpoint inhibitors that sort of transitioned us away from tyrosine kinase inhibitors and targeted therapy 
to the immune checkpoint inhibitors. And I'm going to talk about how these are used in a variety of different settings, both as monotherapy and immune checkpoint inhibitor combined therapy. And then finally, what's happening now is combining both immunotherapy as well as checkpoint inhibitors or targeted therapy together. So the first drug to be uh, approved for the use uh, in renal cell carcinoma uh, was nivolumab in Checkmate 025. And this was used in a population of patients who had previously been treated already with targeted therapy. And what they found were that, that there was a improved overall survival and a comparable progression-free survival in pa pre-treated patients who received Nevo versus emerylimus in the second-line setting. But they found that the toxicity was significantly less than those with Nevo. And this, therefore, in 2015, became the first FDA-approved drug to be used in the second-line setting for metastatic renal cell carcinoma. Subsequently, in Checkmate 214, we now see a combination of both a CTLA-4 as well as a PD-1 inhibitor, and this was the combination of IPI and NEVO. And in this study, this was for upfront patients. These were not pretreated patients, uh, and they found that there was a significant improvement in overall survival and objective response rates uh, in the poor and intermediate risk patient settings. And the toxicity profile was uh, particularly beneficial in those favoring ipinevo in the poor and intermediate risk setting. So because of this, both the FDA and the EMA approved this combination of nevo and ipi uh, for intermediate risk and poor risk patients with advanced renal cell carcinoma. So this was really then the first example of using combined ICI to treat metastatic renal cell carcinoma. So with these, there was a shift now where people were beginning to use immunotherapy not only as second line following targeted therapy, but using it in the front line and using a combination of checkpoint inhibitors together. Subsequently, it makes no surprise that people then thought of combining immuno-oncology drugs with the targeted therapies for use in metastatic renal cell carcinoma. The first study to publish on this was uh, in IM Motion 151, and this was a combination of atezolizumab um, along with uh, uh, bevacizumab versus sutentalone. Now, this combination of both a checkpoint inhibitor and anti-VEGF did demonstrate progression-free survival, particularly in patients who stained for PD-1. The thing is, uh, this uh, combination had been submitted for approval, but they had withdrawn it. So this is not an actual FDA-approved um, drug combination. However, this did demonstrate that there was value in combining targeted therapy along with immunotherapy. So the first of these that were subsequently approved was Keynote 426, which everyone knows about. This is pembrolizumab and exitinib, so a TKI and an anti-PD-1. And the combination of this drug, of these two drugs, uh, is a significant drug to combination to remember because this actually demonstrated progression-free survival and an objective response across all groups. Remember, ipinevo was in the poor to intermediate risk. But when you look at Pembro and Axitinib, this demonstrated benefit regardless of favorable risk, intermediate risk, or poor risk. So not surprisingly, the FDA approved and the EMA both approved this drug for the use uh, of advanced renal cell carcinoma across all groups, and many be, uh, began recommending this in the frontline setting. Uh, subsequently, there is one more combination which is currently approved, and that's the combination of, of Velumab along with Axitinib. And this demonstrated a 31% reduction in disease progression and death, regardless of PD-1 expression. But specifically looking at those with PD-1, they demonstrated a 39% reduction. So this combination of a PD-1 as well as a targeted therapy uh, also gained uh, approval. So at this time, in terms of the uh, FDA in the United States, we have, uh, in the second line setting, we have NEVO. And then in the first line setting, we have NEVO and IPI, PEMBRO and Exitinib, and Alvelumab and Exitinib. So these are currently the FDA-approved checkpoint inhibitor combinations. So because of these advances, this has changed how the AUA, the NCCN, and the EAU uh, make their recommendations. For favorable risk in the front line, it is still a targeted therapy, such as pizopanib or sutinitinib, but axitinib and pembro combination is now for favorable risk considered a front line setting. Then other recommended uh, regimens include the ones that I just mentioned, which is ipinevo, as well as axitinib and, and alvalumab. 
and then the second line setting, you then begin to see a variety of other combinations. Nevo alone is also used in the second line setting if you fail targeted therapy. In terms of the EAU, standard of care now for favorable risk is Pembro and Exitinib. So again, now it is no longer just a targeted therapy, but for favorable risk, it is the combination of both an immunone checkpoint inhibitor along with the targeted therapy. And then for intermediate and poor risk, you've had Exitinib and Pembro along with Ipinevo. So the guidelines have really fallen into place uh, and adjusted themselves accordingly to uh, approval of these drugs. And if you think about how quickly this is moving, three of the four combinations were just approved within the past year. So this is rapidly, rapidly changing. Some of the things that we don't have answered at this time is what about Ipinevo for favorable risk? Is it a good idea to use it in favorable risk or should we just follow what the guidelines say and use a targeted therapy or use the combination of Pembro and Exitinib? Well, I think one of the problems is that Ipinevo has significant toxicity. So for patients with good risk disease, a TKI alone may still be more value. Uh, the other option, of course, is to use Nevo alone. And some people are recommending this and adding the Ipi, which is the more toxic of the two checkpoint inhibitors, as needed based on the response. And how about the combination? Should you use Ipinevo or should you use these new combinations of a targeted therapy along with an immunotherapy? And I think that if you take a look at Ipinevo, although it's more toxic, uh, it does have the highest complete response rate compared to the other two uh, uh, combinations. So many medical oncologists, if the patient's able to tolerate it and they only have one shot, will actually push for Ipinevo uh, over a, a combination. But some of the data uh, for the combinations have still yet to come out. In terms of future directions, how can we incorporate immuno-oncology drugs into high-risk localized disease? And how about metastatic patients who don't have clear cell? And what are the new combinations coming down the road? We all know for high-risk localized disease that TKIs or targeted therapies in the adjuvant setting have all been unsuccessful except for one, and that was the S-TRAC trial. And although sunitinib did not demonstrate improved overall survival, the FDA did grant approval for this uh, based on improved disease-free survival. What was interesting about this was that this study was only in clear cell patients, yet the FDA gave approval across the board for all different histologic subtypes. So because of the success with immunotherapy, there are a number of trials going on right now looking at the use of immunotherapy drugs in the adjuvant setting. And there are just a couple listed here. Nivolumab, which is in the PROSPER trial. This trial is worth mentioning because the patients do get upfront six weeks of NEVO prior to cytoreductive nephrectomy to act as a primer. It's not really neoadjuvant in the sense that they're not trying to achieve some sort of response, but the thought is that by leaving the primary tumor, you can, inc you can stimulate the immune system. There's the combination of IPI-NEVO right there, as well as PEMBRO, and then there's another trial which closed, which was part of the SUOCTC, which is the ATEZO trial, uh, which I'm sure many of you have participated in as well. Now, what do we do about non-clear cell metastatic RCC? Well, the current guidelines really just follow uh, what's done with clear cell. So there are a number of trials which are now investigating the value of using these immunotherapy drugs in non-clear cell. One thing to look at is this study using Pembro as a single monotherapy. And they had an arm of this trial, cohort B, which actually were non-clear cell patients. And they had a 27% overall response rate in the papillary patients and a 34% response rate in unclassified histology. So this is another area of metastatic renal cell that actually may benefit from the use of these immuno-oncology drugs. And there's currently a study ongoing right now with another PD1, PD-L1 inhibitor combined with a MET inhibitor uh, called the Calypso trial, uh, which is looking at use in metastatic papillary renal cell. And this may be, uh, this combination may prove to be the first one specifically designed for patients with non-clear cell histology. Uh, and finally, there's a couple metastatic novel combinations down the road. These use primarily the established checkpoint inhibitors but adding second line or third line or new generation targeted therapies like carbozantinib along with tivoz tivozinib, excuse me, and limvantinib. So the benefit of these new targeted therapies is that they have a wider array 
of targets that they, that they expose patients to. And TiVo in particular has an extremely well tolerated side effect profile. So you can see down the road there's going to continue to be multiple combinations of combining both targeted therapies along with immuno-oncology drugs. So in conclusion, although the overall prognosis for advanced RCC remains poor, we now have unprecedented treatment options available uh, with novel targets, not only using targeted therapies, but also immune checkpoint inhibitors, and then the combination of the two. The one thing to remember is that all of this is for naught if we do not continue to refer our patients and recruit patients uh, for these clinical trials. Thank you. Okay, so we move on to we move on to the next speakers. We had a change in the program, and I invite Professor Alberto Briganti, is an expert leading in prostate cancer and is full professor of urology at Universitas Vita Salute San Raffaele. Please, Alberto. Uh, thank you very much. I would like to thank the scientific committee of the Italian Association of Urology as well as the AUA for this great and invitation. I'm very honored to, today for being here just to address one of the major. Uh, topics in advanced prostate cancer, which is the possible oral immunotherapy, uh, which has become a little bit hot topic after a certain of failures that we have seen in clinical practice and in trials. These are my disclosures. I would like to thank personally one of my research fellows, his name Vito Cucchiara, is here in the room. He actually is working a lot in the field of immuno-oncology. It is the real engine of many data that I'm going to show you today. So what is about cancer immunodediting? So what we know is that immunodediting of cancer is a sort of an extrinsic tumor suppression mechanism. And to make a very long story short, to make a very sophisticated and complicated thing easy, we can divide the immune response to cancer into three phases. One, which is the elimination phase, which initiate, in which initiate with a response by both innate and, and adaptive uh, uh, immunity towards cancer. Then in the equilibrium phase, there is a certain uh, call of other cells like T cells, myeloid derived suppressor cells, macrophages, which actually release cytokines, which create a sort of equilibrium between the tumor and the environment. And then we have the escape phase. And in prostate cancer, the main topic here is one to understand how to decrease the immun immunosuppressive status, which is released by cancer cells. The tumor microenvironment is a very complicated thing. It's not only cancer cell, of course, but it's serious cancer cell plus several other cells which actually gets around the tumor or infiltrate the tumor again. And we are, can divide that into adaptive immunity, which is mainly based on the dritic cells, T cells, and INK, INK cells, or innate immunity. And the hot topic here in prostate cancer is not any longer the T cell, but the hot topic in prostate cancer is how we can modulate the activity of macrophages and myeloid derived suppressor cells. I will get these in a minute. I rely mainly of, of what is available on literature, knowing that many of the trials tested immunotherapy so far have absolutely failed in assessing tumor response and outcomes of patients with prostate cancer, and mainly tested in patients with very advanced disease like metastatic CRPC. The very first day that we had in the literature is based on this vaccination, which is the Cipulicel T, never approved in Europe, basically is a form of adult cell therapy. You give vaccination, you actually take the blood of your patients, you expose the antigen presenting cells to a couple of antigens which you know being on the tumor, and then there is a response back by the T cells which attack the tumor, which is located, of, of course, in different sites. And so you actually uh, 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 teach the, 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 the T cells to fight against the tumor binding these specific antigens. Very disappointing results. This is not the disappointing results overall because this is an impact trial, which is the very first phase three trial which showed there was actually a benefit in overall survival, which anyway was minimal. And there was a lot of side effects which brought FDA to approve anyway the drug, but these did not be approved in Europe. So we cannot use the vaccination, at least in the form of T in Europe so far. There is actually another trial which is again used the vaccination so using the T cells again. It is a PROSVAC, which actually was a trial in which patients with metastatic CRPC were enrolled and patients were randomized to different form of vaccination versus placebo. Actually, no difference at all. So again, another kind of failure of vaccination in, in advanced prostate cancer. 
Now, what about T cells? We are in the era of PD1, PDL1 inhibitors, so this is currently used like pembrolizumab in, in bladder cancer, pembrolizumab even in kidney cancer, or nivolumab, and the same has been tested in prostate cancer as well. And the main modulatory effect here is how to block the interaction between T cells and cancer cells or anti cells by blocking either PD1 or PDL1, the first one being expressed on T cell, the second being expressed either on anti cells or cancer cells, but you can also block CTL4, which is another way of communications between, immune, between T cells and cancer. And again, ipilimumab, which is the, one of the very first tested anti-CTL4 drug, has be also been tested in mutation with the metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer, but again, a failure. So we are in the era of failure of commonly used uh, uh, immunotherapy, but again, this is very advanced disease. Patients in whom anyway the system, the immune system was anyway dysregulated by a very advanced disease and patients were heavily pretreated. There is another, another trial which showed again another failure and they just took patients with metastatic castration resistant disease but before chemotherapy and again using of EP was not effective at all in terms of PSA response but more importantly in terms of patient survival. And actually, there has been a trial which I think many of you know, which has been published in the New England Journal of Medicine, in which uh, it has been tested also the role of anti-PD-1 in many cancers, including prostate cancer, but there were very few patients with prostate cancer, and again, there was no objective response in terms of, 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 of progression. So any kind of modulation of PD-1 and PD-1 so far has actually failed in prostate cancer. This is the biggest trial available so far in terms of the role of pembrolizumab, which is again an anti pdl one drug that we currently use, for example, in bladder cancer. This has been tested also in prostate cancer, but again, in patients with metastatic castration resistant disease. This, the Keynote 199, has been just published or presented at ASCO, not published yet. But what we can derive from this trial, that there is some subgroup of patients who might respond to pembrolizumab. And these are more or less 80 or to 10% of the overall patient population. And it seems that these patients who are more likely to respond are those who have some germline mutations in terms of DNA repair genes, uh, mutation uh, repair genes in like BRCA1, BRCA2, or ATM. But what we have also understood is another, another thing. I think, I think you have seen these slides so far already. And prostate cancer is actually here. The tumor mutational burden, the actually the mismatch repair defects in prostate cancer in terms of genomic assessment is very weak and is very low. So we are talking about a, a, a disease which has by itself, in the vast majority of the cases, a low mutational burden on which we can act. Why do we say that? Because it has been shown that patient with actually, I don't know if there is a pointer here, but anyway, patient with DNA mismatch defect are those who are actually worse prognosis. And these patients are those who have higher rates of PD-1 cells infiltration in the tumor, high rates of lymphocytes in the tumor. So mainly what we will see in the future that we can target the population of patients with the mismatch repair genes and then are likely the most suitable candidates for therapy with either anti-PD-1 or PDL one therapy. So there are a lot of trials now. So we are in the era of immunotherapy. We cannot think that we are not testing immunotherapy in prostate cancer as well. You can find any trial. We are even giving, according to a trial which is currently going on in San Raffaele, the PI is one of my fellow, Giorgio Gandaglia. We are giving pebrolizumab prior to surgery to see whether there is any response in, in the prostate, but still this is a phase two trial, which we will start soon. So there are alternative approaches, yes. I mean, what I would like to, to tell you today is that we should not undermine the effect of the so-called abscopal effect. So now, there is a big trial in prostate cancer which showed that if you irradiate the primary tumor, only the primary in patients with low-volume metastatic disease upfront, you may increase survivals. And it's possible that this is related to the fact that immune, the radiation therapy exposed novel antigens toward which T cells act and this is then, I mean, distributed to, towards the other side of metastasis. So it's possible the radiation therapy might modulate the immune response, and there will be trial more and more ongoing combining radiation therapy plus, um, uh, plus, uh, uh, plus uh, immunotherapy. And this is another study which, again, it's an animal model. Many of these data I'm going to show you are based on animal models in which if you combine radiation therapy with anti-PD-1 therapy, you actually have great, uh, the greatest effect 
because we think radiation therapy exposes novel antigens and go off the, in, in, and of course give novel rises of, of, of cell infiltrations toward which we can use anti-PD-1 therapy. So what about, what, what about uh, sorry, I, I have to, to, to go back. The other thing that we are doing at San Rafael as well, it's a very nice thing. So we are doing like the CAR T therapy. So we are trying to engineering T cells towards cancer. We have kind of strong immunological department at our place. So we are doing something which has been published already. You actually give your T cells the receptor towards PSMA, okay? And so you instruct your T cells to fight against, against PSMA and to increase the leases of cancer cells. Of course, you, this is, might not be enough. You also need to suppress other, uh, other, other cytokines like TNF, T TGF beta. And in that, in that way, you can immune, immune modulate the immunosuppression of the tumor. And then, as you can see in these slides, actually having significant reduction of tumor burden. The last topic we have been, which we have been involved with is the so-called therapy uh, modulating the myelodylized suppressor cells. I mean, the myelodylized suppressor cells are, sorry, I'm, I'm just get going back to, to, to these slides, which instead, the, the, the ability to actually act on macrophages. And again, I want to show you that, I would like to highlight to you that the macrophages is one of the main the targets of, 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 of therapy now, or of research now, and we are working as well on macrophages because actually it seems that they modulate the entire response of T cells and also the interaction and the immune modulation within the tumor. So there are different ways to work on macrophages. One is to block the so-called CXCR2. There is a trial going on here, and you block the, mac the interaction between CR2 and CXCL2, and actually you block the interaction between cancer cells and macrophages, and the, 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 the activation of macrophages uh, mean, uh, make, make the tumor very much infiltrated by T cells as well. Last but not least, we had just published on Nature with a, in a, in a, in a, in a, with, together with another group, which is, which is Bay and Rorias, Masden, and in Bellinzona, another paper in which we instead used the, or studied the activity of myelodular suppressor cells. These are cells which are derived from like innate immunity, and these are the differentiated myeloid cells which can act on tumor cells as well. And we published and we found that the release of these cells of interleukin-23 was able to decrease the tumor size and actually to also uh, uh, prolong uh, uh, this, this survival of, the, of this animal model. And we tested also on patients, and we saw that patients with metastatic crustacean resistant disease with worse, worse prognosis had higher rates of implantation on myeloid derived suppressor cells. These are just some data, I, I, I apologize if many of the data are coming from basic science, but in prostate cancer, again, the classical way of treating the disease, immunomodulating, immunomodulation, is kind of failing because PD-1 and pd one have failed over time, and we are now understanding how to modulate the immune system, and this is going to be mainly macrophages or, in any way, the innate immunity. So thank you again very much for your kind invitation, and I hope you enjoy Venice. Uh, as always, we learned so much from Professor Briganti. We're going to keep the program moving. Uh, we'll actually have Dr. Holzerlein from the U.S. Uh, talk about actually immuno-oncology, and his focus will be on bladder cancer. Before he starts, I want to make sure to remind everyone that there are surveys that are necessary to be filled out uh, to make sure that uh, we, we have hopefully gained some information and provided some information for everyone. So please, uh, please fill out the surveys. Uh, and Dr. Holzblein, like I said, will be focusing on bladder cancer. Thanks, Jeff. Sure. Well, again, uh, thank you for having me. And uh, as I've uh, said multiple times, uh, I've had a fantastic time in Italy. The Italians are amazing hosts. And uh, I've had way too much food and way too much to drink. I've got a lot of work when I get back to the United States to get that off. I'm going to move through uh, quickly through some of this um, because you've seen this. That You're going to see these are consistent themes. The data that's very similar in kidney cancer, less so in prostate cancer, but in bladder as well, and certainly the mechanisms are all of the same, so I'll, I'll skip through some of those slides more quickly and go to some of what I think are some of the more unique things about bladder cancer, and uh, I'll also, in, in my typical fashion, sprinkle in some opinions of mine um, and sort of some of my beliefs uh, that aren't always supported by data. Uh, so I have no disclosures. Um, 
You know, bladder cancer, the one thing I do want to point out, of all the cancers that we treat, has the longest history of immunotherapy, and that's BCG, of course. Um, BCG was first uh, tried by Morales in uh, the mid-1970s and was approved for use in 1990 by the FDA. Um, we don't still exactly understand how BCG works, but certainly one of the mechanisms that's proposed is through a T-cell response. The rationale for using immunotherapy in bladder cancer uh, is um, well supported, and that's because we know that it has a high mutational burden, and we've seen other slides throughout presentations that have shown that it is one of the cancers associated with the highest mutational burden, and therefore could uh, be susceptible to the use of immunotherapy. And of course, it has known PDL1 expression as well. Um, there's a real need in bladder, obviously, and that is because you know a full 10% of patients are going to present with metastatic disease at the time of their diagnosis. And although primary cytotoxic chemotherapy remains the cornerstone of treatment for these patients, we know that the vast majority of these patients are not cured by chemotherapy. Um, and so durable responses or cures are less than 10%. Furthermore, and probably more importantly, is that many of these patients are elderly and they're just simply not candidates for the type of chemotherapy that's necessary. And that's primarily cisplatin-based chemotherapy and that can be due to a number of things. Um, and again, as you look at the different uh, survival rates by stage, the more disease they have and uh, the worse it is. If we look at chemotherapy just in general, this is some historical data just looking at response rates to single agents, and I won't spend much time here, but again, cisplatin being the cornerstone of chemotherapy for bladder cancer. And I think it's these combinations that have been tried and, and some of the, the best success as from Cora Sternberg's work showing that MVAC had an overall response rate of about 58% um, with a complete response rate of about 11%. I want to highlight this just for a minute, and that's because I'm not going to show you a single slide on immunotherapy that has a response rate like this. So I think we need to be careful about sort of saying, oh, we're just going to go to immunotherapy. We must remember that if the patient can get chemotherapy, they should get chemotherapy. The response rates are better. Um, immunotherapy has a role, and we'll talk about those roles uh, as I go forward. So until uh, 2016, we really had no second-line agents. Obviously, in Europe, benfluene was approved for use, um, but in the United States, it never received appro uh, approval. Um, we do can use benfluene and uh, have done that occasionally with some good response anecdotally. Um, and taxanes have probably been the, the second-line therapy of cornerstone in the United States, but uh, progression-free survival is about two to six months and overall survival about five to eight. So not, not very encouraging. Here are the uh, agents, and again, I won't spend much time on the mechanism slide, we've seen that. And here was just the evolution of systemic therapy for urethelial cancer. So really, until 2016, with the approval of atezolizumab, um, we really hadn't had anything uh, in, in the United States for quite some time. So the first one was the uh, atezolizumab trial, uh, or, sorry, pembrolizumab trial that uh, was just a phase one study. And that's really what got people excited about using immunotherapy. And it was using um, patients who had progressed on platinum. Once pembrolizumab had shown this, then again, you started seeing all these other agents come on uh, the market and on the scene. And the first uh, really one was atezolizumab. Um, and this is just showing that there were a significant proportion of patients that do respond to uh, atezolizumab in heavily pretreated patients. Um, the phase two study is what ultimately led to its approval, and that was the first agent, immunotherapy agent, approved in bladder cancer in May of 2016 based on phase two data. Um, the overall uh, response rate, uh, complete responses and objective responses, um, was about 15%. So again, if we go back to sort of what we showed about chemotherapy, not as much as chemotherapy, but much better than what we had seen with many of the other second-line agents. Updated data that was presented at ASCO in 2017 showed an overall response rate of 16% with a complete response rate of 6%, duration of response about 22 months, and one-year overall survival of 29%. So Still better than what we had, but again, not comparable to uh, uh, certainly induction chemotherapy. Uh, unfortunately, atezolizumab failed to demonstrate an overall survival advantage when compared to the medical oncologist's choice of chemotherapy. 
And I think that's a little bit of an interesting trial design. So it didn't just sort of default to sort of saying, you know, you had to get carboplatin or you had to get vinfluine. They basically let the medical oncologist tailor the type of chemotherapy. Um, now that might have doomed atezolizumab a little bit, but also what probably hurt them a little bit was they, they only allowed patients with PDL1 staining to be in, uh, enrolled in that trial. And as I'll show you in some of the data a little bit later, that doesn't always predict response to chemotherapy. Fatigue, we haven't talked a lot about adverse events, but the most common adverse events across all immunotherapies is going to be fatigue. And so it's really important that we're talking about in second line therapy, typically non-curable patients, that we're not putting a significant burden on their quality of life. And I will tell patients, you know, in many of my patients on immunotherapy, I honestly can't tell they're on it. So other than fatigue, sometimes pruritus or itching, um, they really tolerate these quite well. When they do have significant adverse events, they can be pretty bad, but most of the time they're pretty easily managed. This is just the uh, nivolumab study, and again, demonstrating similar uh, data to the tezolizumab, and eventually it was approved. Um, and the Checkmate 275 study, again, uh, looked at overall response rates, which were quite similar to that of atezolizumab. And then moving on to uh, nivolumab, uh, similar again in terms of response rates um, to the other two, um, and uh, again showing progression-free survival advantage. So uh, the one that is maybe slightly different is pembrolizumab. And the reason that this is slightly different is that pembrolizumab to date has been the only immunotherapy that has demonstrated an improvement in overall survival in second line bladder cancer. And so although the others we think maybe there's methodologic flaws on why they did not show that, pembrolizumab to date is the only one that's been able to demonstrate that. And here's again just showing the data with an overall response rate of about 21%, which again is slightly higher than what we've seen with some of the other agents. And again, I don't know that we can completely explain that, but that's, that's certainly what we've seen in this. And again, a, an improvement in overall survival. So again, these are the five uh, currently approved agents in the United States by FDA, and you have a, uh, a bar plot on the right just showing that all of these uh, do have some improvement over historical controls of chemotherapy. I do want to just make uh, a, a quick note that there are um, two agents that are used or approved by the FDA is first-line treatment. So if a patient is platinum ineligible, they cannot get cisplatin, they can go on to receive either atezolizumab or pembrolizumab. However, um, in May of this year, the FDA put a warning on that, and they basically said if they do not have significant PDL1 staining, then you cannot use these agents first line. You should go on to use a chemotherapy such as carboplatin, taxane, or something else. So those, that's the caveat that got put on that, and that's because data that came out later demonstrated that there looked like, particularly in people who were not pdl one positive, that chemotherapy was superior to that. So again, upfront treatment with pembrolizumab and atezolizumab, if they have high pdl one staining, if not, then again, uh, chemotherapy should be your, your agent. Um, one of the holy grails is obviously trying to predict who's going to respond to immunotherapy, because it doesn't make sense to give these very expensive agents if they're not going to respond. Um, we do know that high mutational burdens correlate with better response, so particularly uh, DNA damage repair genes, um, and that's done through RNA sequencing. However, it's, expensive, it's still quite expensive and not ubiquitously available in the United States, so really only two main companies that can help us with this, Keras and Foundation One. Um, molecular subtyping may be useful. Uh, it appears that the luminal two may have the best response rates um, for atezolizumab. For pembrolizumab, it was the basal, so I'm sure not, we're not quite sure which is best. Basal does seem to uh, correlate with higher PDL1 expression. You know, we talked about PDL1 expression, but you have to remember that the atezolizumab uh, trial, which tried to use PDL1 expression, did not show a benefit when they used that. So I don't think right now PDL1 expression in bladder should dictate whether the patient should get the immunotherapy or not. Um, there's some agents suggest it might, and, but, and I mentioned in first-line therapy. But otherwise, if you have a patient who has failed systemic chemotherapy, 
uh, whether they're PDL1 positive or not, they should go on to probably get immunotherapy. And then there's some other dynamic markers such as interferon gamma that may be useful as well. Again, this is something that I mentioned earlier. And again, if you just look across the board, look at the responses to chemotherapy. They're much better than they are to immunotherapy. We have to be careful. I do not think the data supports foregoing chemotherapy or using chemotherapy. That's the most appropriate uh, treatment at this time. Immunotherapy would be second line for those patients who are either ineligible or fail. There are currently over 53 trials in the United States uh, that are listed for immunotherapy. I'm going to just mention a couple very quickly. Pure 01, which was mentioned in the general session, which is a neoadjuvant study of pembrolizumab in uh, bladder cancer prior to radical cystectomy, showed a 40% pathologic complete response rate, which is, I would say, similar to what we see in chemotherapy and very interesting, but we'll have to wait. Ambassador, which has been using uh, pembrolizumab either in the adjuvant setting after neoadjuvant chemotherapy or if they did not receive neoadjuvant chemotherapy for more advanced disease. Um, there are multiple bladder preservation studies as well, so looking at immunotherapy plus radiation therapy, that makes a lot of sense because we, we uh, induce an immunologic response when we radiate patients, so you may see trimodal therapy plus immunotherapy, um, and some of that's based on some very interesting data that came from the Pacific trial, which was a lung cancer trial, showing that that radiation and immunotherapy improved outcomes. And then, of course, we have a non-muscle invasive, uh, multiple non-muscle invasive bladder cancer trials. However, the atezolizumab trial, which was for BCG refractory disease, was stopped in the spring. Now, we're still following that, but no, patient, uh, no new patients are being accrued. And that's because it did not meet its primary endpoint, and it didn't really seem to help. And I, su I suggested this when I was teaching summer school. I think that's because of our carcinoma in situ patients. I do not think they respond very well to these agents, and we need to be careful about that. And then, of course, novel combinations, which have been mentioned previously. So uh, in, just in conclusion, I'd just uh, wrap up and say there remains a novel need for new agents in the treatment of bladder cancer, particularly in platinum failures or platinum ineligible people. You should remember chemotherapy remains the cornerstone of treatment for these patients. We have five approved agents in the United States um, and two that can be used up front. We need ongoing trials uh, that are evaluating it in other disease states as well as combinations. And of course, we need better biomarkers to help us predict which patients are going to respond. So overall uh, take home messages, overall response rates of immunotherapy, about 15 to 20 percent. Uh, thence, it, there are well-tolerated agents. Remember, pembrolizumab is the only agent so far to demonstrate an overall improvement in survival. Um, one thing we didn't talk about or not talk about in anything is duration of therapy. We really don't know how long to continue these uh, drugs, and there's really not very good data on that. And again, we need new biomarkers. So I'll wrap up there. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jeff. Uh, we've got, uh, we're just going to take a few extra minutes here as we finish up the program with Dr. Huang, who will uh, just take a few minutes to focus in on the side effect profile. Uh, I want to thank everyone ag again for, for the attention. Um, Bill? All right, so just in the last few minutes here, um, I'm going to quickly just discuss the management of some of these uh, IO drug side effects. Uh, I don't know how many of you actually treat patients directly with the use of these drugs, but even if you don't, it's probably a good idea to recognize these side effects because they can be very subtle, and it's critical that you identify them early. So again, we're just going to talk about the management of immune-related adverse events. Um, these are the drugs that were just previously discussed that are used for both kidney cancer as well as bladder cancer. Uh, and I'm just going to go through a few case examples because, again, even if you don't give these drugs yourself, you are going to see these patients in your office and you should recognize that this is perhaps an IO-related adverse event. So it can really affect any system in your body, the endocrine system, respiratory, GI, the skin particularly, as well as renal and liver. So the first case is an 87-year-old gentleman with metastatic urethelial carcinoma, heavy smoker, had metastatic disease to the bladder, the lymph nodes, and the lung. He was put on a PD-1, pdl one inhibitor uh, as a single-agent therapy on trial and actually demonstrated a res complete response after just six weeks of therapy. 
However, after cycle 10, he developed some fatigue, which as uh, Dr. Hosplein mentioned is very common, but he also developed a mild progressive cough, no fevers, no chest pain, uh, no sick contacts, and evidence of pneumonitis on a chest CT. Uh, and you can see here that this is a very common presentation for uh, IO-induced uh, pneumonitis. Again, the clinical presentations are very subtle, and rarely do they progress to grade three or four. Uh, however, early intervention is key because this is preventable in terms of progressing, because if it does progress, the, 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 uh, the side effects can be devastating. Uh, so the treatment for this is to initiate early oral corticosteroids, prednisone one milligram per kilogram, and this should provide you with a dramatic improvement in symptoms within 24 to 48 hours. If the patient does not improve, then it's recommended to go on to get IV steroids, which you can taper over the next four to six weeks. Uh, this is just a graph on, on how you manage it based on the severity. Most of these are going to be the same for every type of uh, adverse event, which is to either delay the therapy or discontinue the therapy completely and to start corticosteroids, either orally or IV, again, depending on the grade. For grade three and four with pneumonitis and a few other of the side effects, they really do recommend discontinuing the therapy altogether, and I'll get into that in a little bit. In case two, we have a patient who received neoadjuvant chemotherapy and then trimodal therapy and then progressed. He subsequently received both PD-1 and CTLA-4, so probably ipinevo, and had a partial response after eight weeks. And he developed pretty significant skin toxicity rapidly after, after uh, initiation of the treatment. Again, the skin presentation is variable, and if it's very subtle, you can just treat it with topical steroids and some ointments to help prevent the itching, uh, and you can even use antihistamines. But you can see when it does get severe, it does require a more aggressive treatment, which includes holding the treatment itself, oral steroids, and then you can potentially resume the therapy uh, after the symptoms have uh, resolved. Obviously, if they develop something severe like TENS, then you should permanently discontinue the medication. Uh, this is another patient here who received uh, PDL1 and CTLA4 combination for metastatic urethelial cancer and developed watery diarrhea. Uh, and this became pretty severe, up to eight times a day, just after this third uh, cycle. There was no evidence of any nausea, vomiting, peritoneal signs, abdominal pain, or blood in the stools. Uh, and so given the de degree of severity, this patient was maintained on the treatment and given prednisone. However, one thing that, that uh, we've begun to realize over time, particularly with the GI patients, uh, is that you can give Remicade or infliximab uh, to help treat these uh, symptoms. Now, this patient did improve uh, after giving the Remicade. Uh, and then did resume the treatment. However, the diarrhea uh, recurred uh, and subsequently required both prednisone and additional uh, doses of a biologic and subsequently had to discontinue the treatment altogether. This graph, again, is very similar to the one that I demonstrated for pneumonitis, uh, which is, again, oral steroids, IV steroids, discontinuation of treatment, but the most important thing is to recognize the signs when they are not severe, when they're not grade three and four, because the uh, subsequent consequences can be severe. And in this particular situation, this patient was able to resume treatment, however, ultimately discontinued it. Uh, again, this is just summarizing what I just mentioned, the use of steroids, IV steroids and oral, and adding a biologic such as Remicade for severe or refractory disease. Uh, finally, I just want to finish up because we only have a few minutes. This one is an example of arthritis uh, following use of a checkpoint inhibitor. Uh, this patient uh, tested positive for a variety of different autoimmune uh, back factors in her blood. Uh, and in this particular situation, although this is not uncommon, or this is uncommon, again, the treatment would be steroids here, discontinuation of treatment, and adding a biologic, such as infliximab. Uh, and then just in the few minutes, I think it's worth mentioning that there are subsequent effects that can be permanent. And this often happens uh, in the thyroid or in the pituitary or adrenal glands. So unlike GI and skin and the lung, which I mentioned, uh, if you do see adverse events uh, in the endocrine system, these may be irreversible and the patient may be uh, required to undergo lifelong supplementation. Uh, and then finally, hepatotoxicity is one that we also have to keep an eye on. 
Again, the treatment is holding the medication and initiating systemic corticosteroids. So in summary, uh, the AE events may be irreversible, particularly the endocrinopathies, and uh, these do require ultimately re replacement. But the key thing here is to recognize these very early, particularly because they're treatable and they're generally reversible. Uh, it is unclear at this time whether or not we should challenge these patients uh, and resume treatment if they've had some of these side effects. Uh, as the, we may be um, unroofing or showing some autoimmune uh, problems that the patient may already have. Uh, biologics are very effective in the treatment, particularly if they don't respond to steroids. Uh, and at this time, uh, there is no sort of way to recognize which one of these patients are going to develop these side effects. So again, early diagnosis and aggressive treatment with steroids uh, is key to preventing life-threatening consequences. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, that concludes the session. Uh, again, uh, the AUA wants to express uh, their appreciation and, and uh, look forward to future even stronger relationships. Thanks again. Thank you very much. Enjoy.